All right, guys. Uh, so I had scheduled the the mid unit quiz for Friday, and then uh, a couple more activities. A what? <laughs> I scheduled the mid-unit quiz for Friday and then a couple more activities and the unit test to be uh, Wednesday or Thursday of next week. Um, but there, the concepts that we will be going over after the quiz, I don't consider valuable unless you're taking chemistry AB. So I moved them to chemistry AB. Um, so the, what was the mid-unit quiz is now the unit test on Friday. Okay? And then we're going to move on to the next unit um, the following week. So that means less math for you. You're like, yay, less math. Um, so if you're really interested in what it was, it was a concept called mass defect and binding energy, but I'm just going to move that to chemistry AB because it's more of their unit stuff anyway. Um, so today we're talking about half-life, and uh, we briefly mentioned what half-life was before. Half-life is the time it takes for half of your sample to go away. Okay. So time for half of your sample to decay. And it always follows this basic pattern. We talked about that before. Um, from 100% to 50% to 25% to 12%. I think you're going to enjoy tomorrow's Half-Life Lab. There's candy involved. Um, you might have done it in middle school, but we'll do it again today or tomorrow. So in a 100-gram sample of bismuth, in one half-life, how much is there? 50 grams. Okay. So half-life is the time it takes for half of your sample to decay into something else. Does it disappear? No. No. Where does that, where does that 50 grams of bismuth go? It turns into helium. alpha particles and thallium. Okay? It turns into alpha particles and thallium. It doesn't just disappear. And uh, that's one of the things that we found uh, when we did the analytics. We found that students thought that when nuclear particles decay, they just disappear. They don't dis disappear, They're, they convert it to something else. Now, there's, if it's a gas, that thing might end up in space, but if it's another compound that's a solid at room temperature or normal earth temperatures, it stays put. So bismuth is a metal, so is thallium. So you would look at it and be like, come on, come on. It's like, hey, I'm turning to thallium here. You're like, I, I don't see it. I just, it's, you're still a metal. Um, but the bismuth is turning into thallium. You just don't see it because bismuth and thallium are both metals. Now, when something decays into a gas, it might float away to space, but, you know, it's, yeah, it doesn't disappear. It doesn't decay into nothingness, okay? That's the conservation of uh, matter that you're supposed to learn in, like, fourth grade. The conservation of matter tells us that all matter in the universe is, is pretty much the same. Matter and energy is conserved mm -hmm. before and after, same. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, so how much is there after two half-lives? 25, 25. 25 grams. Okay, this is easy stuff. After 20 days, oh, maybe you should chat with your neighbor and see if you can figure out what it, how much is left after 20 days. Is it 6.25? Uh, is that what you should ask your neighbor? Yeah. yeah. And your neighbor agrees? Yeah. That's not 25, right? That's not the second half. Right? Yeah, 25 is the second half. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 At time equals zero, you got 100 grams. How much do you have if you're 20 minutes? Okay, if, uh, if your neighbor said that there is less than 50 grams, raise your hand. Good. If your neighbor said there was less than 20 grams, raise your hand. Good. If your neighbor said there was, there was less than 10 grams, raise your hand. Okay. If your neighbor said there was less than five grams, raise your hand. Okay, good. So six. So uh, six point two five. Okay, so we go from zero half lives. We've got a hundred. In fact, I find sometimes it's kind of fun to make a little table that looks like this. Sometimes it's kind of fun to make a little table that's like this is half lives. So after one half life, you got fifty. After two half lives, you got twenty five. After three half lives, you got 12.5. After four half lives, you got 6.25. Okay, so one half life is uh, five days, two half lives is 10 days, three half lives is 15 days, and four half lives is 20 days. So I find it's kind of fun to make a little table. But yeah, about six and a half or 6.25. Mm -hmm. All right, and once again, the uh, the the half life always looks kind of like this. If you if you graph half lives. In this case, it's not half-lives, it's number of days, so that's no half-lives, one half-life, two, three, four, and five, and so on. What was the name of Make sense? Question. What is the name of that graph? Because I know it has a specific name. Decay. Where, 
Just, just have like to get graph. Okay, well, I always think about it like, from a math term because there's a it's a graph that never reaches zero. Technically. Ask your math teacher. Ask Schultz. He knows things. Okay. Ask Strachan. He knows things. Yeah, those two are smart. Okay. <laughs> Those two are smart. So now that you have some uh, a little bit of uh, practice, so you can do it on your own. So let's try this. The half life of cobalt 50, 60 Yay, that's mine. Is five years. If you have ten grams of cobalt sixty, how much do you have after fifteen years? Do you have an answer or a question? I have an answer. Cool. And um, so let's give everybody a minute to work on it on their own or do it in your head, um, and uh, just because yeah. Let's all be a team. We're a team. Team. We're a team. They left the carpet fit perfectly in there. All right. If uh, if you got less than five grams, raise your hand. Cool. Less than two grams, raise your hand. All right. Less than one gram, raise your hand. Alright, um, so in so in one half life you're gonna have uh, five grams? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? And in two half lives you're gonna have two point five grams. Mm -hmm. And three half lives you're gonna have one point two five grams. Mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense? So this is gonna be uh, five years, this is gonna be ten years, this is gonna be fifteen years. Make sense? Okay. Um, now, of course, there's math exercises you can do to do, to do half-life on your calculator, um, but I don't want to do them. I'm going to do tables. Um, if you want to do math half life these then you can take chemistry AP. They like doing math in that class. So americium-242 is a half-life of six hours. If you started with 24 grams and you now have three grams, how much time has passed? So give it a shot. Six grams, and in three half lives, we're going to have three grams. So three half lives is 18 hours. Cool. Now give me a thumbs up if you can handle this. This is something you can do. Okay. Wave your hand around if you're like, I'm so confused. We do it all over again. Okay. So, question. Yeah, I'm going like, in one half-life there's 12 grams, in two half-life there's six, in three half-life there's three, and so on. You can put a zero, you can say zero half-lives, there's 24 if you want, um, but that just makes sense to me. Question? I'm just, how do you... Okay, let's go over it again. So, I'll go to over it again slower. So, again, there is math exercises that we can do, but I, I don't see the reason for, until we really have to do the math. So I make a table where I have uh, the number of half-lives and actually that's right here. Number of half-lives and then the time and the mass. So in zero half-lives <laughs> and zero time, you're gonna have the full 24 grams. <laughs> so far so good? Now in one half-life, this is gonna split in half, and you're gonna have 12 grams. And one half life is six hours. Cool. Oh, I started with the wrong number. Oh, okay. Do I should I continue or? Yeah, I've not got it. So two half lives, twelve hours, six grams, and so on. Next. 
IE131 is a half life of eight days. Question, yes. So the answer to that was how many times it was nine hours? 18 hours. How did you get that? Um, okay, so uh, I needed three half lives to reduce to three grams, and that's 18 hours, because it's six hours times three. Oh, it's six hours. Oh, yeah. Okay. ID 131 has a half life of eight days. If you have eight grams of ID 131 in 16 days past, how much ID do you have left? Two grams. Two grams. Oh. Easy, right? Yeah. So, how many half lives have gone by? Two. Two. After one half life, you got four grams. And after two half lives, you got two grams. <laughs> Lastly, tin has 126 at the half life of 1,100 years. Um, so, and if you have 7.8 grams left of a 250 gram sample, how much time has passed? This might take a little. This might take a little tabling. Greek system, I guess. Something Greekish. Okay. Yeah, that'd be my guess. I do know M is a thousand, which is weird in the Greek uh, the Greek number. And if you put an M over bar over, it's a million. Well, oh, this is K. It's K short for ten kilo, right? Then every ten kilo is one thousand. There you go. Yeah. But that sounds. It's kilo kilo thousand kilo years. Okay. So does this make sense? Yes. Ever get half a half a million years? Yeah. All right. All right, so we're going to come back to Half-Life in, uh, in, in a practice activity. Before we do, we got to talk a little bit about atomic stability. Somebody asked me, um, might have been Aaron, I think it's in the front row, uh, about why things are stable and why things aren't stable, like really early on. And then you did the simulation. And in the simulation, what you found was if you have not enough neutrons or too many neutrons, then the atom goes shaky, 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 shaky. Okay? So stability has something to do with the protons and the neutrons. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Think about this for a second. Are you paying attention? Mm -hmm. The single most important concept in all of physical science and dating is that opposites do what? Attract. Attract. While likes do what? Separate. Repel. Repel. Okay. That's the single most important concept in the entire known universe is that opposites attract and likes repel. So what keeps the electrons zooming around the nucleus? Oh, the, po the protons because it's positive. Exactly. The protons hold the electrons. They're pulling the electrons toward the nucleus. If the protons were not there, the electrons would fly off. Kind of like when you're playing tetherball. If you hit the tetherball really hard, what keeps the tetherball from flying across the, the playground? The rope. The rope, right? The rope is producing an attractive force on the tetherball. Without the rope, les balles go away. Okay? And without the attraction, electrons will go away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's what holds the nucleus together. That's what holds the nucleus together. The attraction of the electrons or the protons. I want to go, but I have to move, so I keep spinning. Okay, kind of like a tetherball. That's the first part. But here's the second part. If opposites attract, then what do likes do? Repel. Repel. If that is the case, how do you explain a nucleus that has a bunch of protons in there? How do you explain it? Oh, it's, oh, I know. Because, like, since there's no other Okay. You said that uh, neutrons are like a combination of protons and electrons, so protons are being attracted to the electrons. Mm, but the electron, the moment it's created, it gets kicked out of the nucleus. Do neutrons cancel? Ah, you're getting there. Yeah, you're getting there. I'm assuming the protons are attracted to the uh, electrons, but the neutrons are stopping them from moving to the electrons? The issue we have is that big ball of protons should not exist. Because that big ball of protons should be a bunch of positive charges. They should repel each other. Like a bunch of stinky people. Do they like, get in between protons to keep them from pushing each other away? Yep. Okay. So, neutrons. Continuing our... Neutron discussion. Neutrons act like nuclear glue. Neutrons act like nuclear glue. And here's this part of this concept that I'm going to just plant a seed and then I won't deal with until next year when you take chemistry AP. The neutrons, when they are in the nucleus, have to give up a tiny amount of energy and create a web. Okay? So imagine you're doing daycare and you put 10 toddlers in the center of the room. How long are they going to stay in the center of the room? Not very, long. Not very long. But then if you use some of your energy as the daycare worker to create a system of ropes to tie them together, then you can keep them all in one place. And that's what the neutrons are doing. The protons are like, are like toddlers who just want to play. And the neutrons are like the daycare workers that keep them all in place. They create a web of nuclear glue. So the neutrons sacrifice a tiny amount of their mass, which then turns into energy. According to this fun formula, E equals mc squared. It basically means the neutrons sacrifice a tiny amount of their energy or mass that becomes energy and it creates a web of nuclear glue that holds the protons together. Now, if you don't have enough neutrons, it's like having a not enough daycare workers. Some of the toddlers are going to escape. Similarly, if you don't have enough neutrons, some of the protons are going to escape. It's going to be a uh, it's going to be an unstable nucleus. Similarly, if you have too many uh, daycare workers, then a couple of daycare workers are going to get bored and they're going to go check their, their phones. They'll be like, I don't care, I'm not doing this. Similarly, if you have too many neutrons, that nucleus will be unstable and the neutrons will escape. Make sense? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there is ultimately a perfect ratio of neutrons to protons. It's simply called the uh, it's simply called the NP ratio. Okay. 
So neutrons act like nuclear glue to hold the protons together. Without the neutrons, the protons' positive charge, they fly apart. So what we do is we look at the ratio of neutrons to protons. An ideal ratio, I'm going to show you the, the, sun, the, the next thing is, the ideal ratio for a small nucleus is different than a big nucleus. <coughs> Similarly, if you have like two or three, if you have two or three uh, toddlers in the daycare, one adult can handle it. If you have 50 toddlers in the daycare, you're gonna need a lot more adults. So the best ratio for stable atoms when they are small is one to one. The best ratio for big atoms is one to 1.5, or sorry, 1.5 to one. For instance, if you look at nitrogen, nitrogen is atomic number seven and has a mass of 14 which means, how many protons? Seven. seven. How many neutrons? Seven. seven. We're talking about what that number represents later, why it's Wait, not what? a whole number. Hmm? So, the big, so the big ratio is one to one, 20, 1.25? Small, the best ratio is one to one. Whoa. Seven to seven. Oxygen, eight, and 16, one to one. Okay, so for small nuclei, <coughs> The best ratio is, there we go, one to one. For small nuclei, the best ratio is one to one. Three to three, seven to seven, 10 to 10. But as you get larger and larger, you notice something. Look at bismuth. Bismuth has 83 protons, but a mass of 209. Alexa, what is 209 minus 83? 209 minus 83 is 126. Okay, so bismuth has 126 neutrons, which is almost exactly 1.5 times 83. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. in, that, in that ballpark, it's like, it's like 1.4. But as you get heavier and heavier, you need more and more neutrons. The heaviest nuclei need 1.5 neutrons to every proton. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So that's uh, that's the ratio, and then that gives rise to the band of stability.